So <clears throat> one of the things I always like to do is I like to think about um, what would, you know, philosophy is that which undergirds our world. I think it's probably one of the better definitions for it. The science or the study of that which undergirds. And undergird is one of these terms like, you know, if you hear the word girder, like a girder, um, you know, there's, I think probably somewhat, you know, you've heard the word girdle, which is a thing women wear to pull in their stomach and, uh, you know, make themselves appear skinnier, also pushes up their bosom and other things. And so, um, you know, that, that would be a girdle. And so it's something that sort of supports their body in a way that makes them supposedly more attractive or more appealing. And that's sort of the idea that it's a support for a woman. But a girder is also something that, you know, within buildings, within bridges, um, there are things called girders. And girders are essentially that sometimes, you know, you'll drive by a bridge that's being rebuilt and they will have ripped off the the lane across the top, that asphalt piece that you drive across, and there will be these big metal bars underneath. And that essentially is what the girders are. They're the part that lie beneath that hold up the bridge. They, they're in buildings, they're in all kinds of things, and that's what a girding is. And so philosophy is the study of that which undergirds our world. And so the idea here is that, you know, with that our world is made up of you know, certain assumptions um, that we go about our lives and <clears throat> we go about our lives and make assumptions about um, what is real. We make assumptions about the fact that, um, you know, that, you know, what is right and wrong, we have a certain sense. We make assumptions about a God, about what is real, what's physical, you know, whether or not they're souls and angels and devils and all types of things. And all of these are things that sort of these undergirdings, these things that, you know, are sort of these ideas that rest beneath. And that's what philosophy is trying to get at. It's sort of these things that oftentimes we go without looking at or assuming or thinking much about. And those are the questions that become essential. Now, what I always do is I, you know, I, I talk about here that, you know, philosophy is more than just... Um, you know, superficial knowledge, but rather philosophy is getting at these deeper questions within a discipline. That if you get a PhD in history, if you get a doctorate of philosophy of history, you are going to become not just a person who knows history, you're going to become a person who writes history, who goes out and researches, and perhaps is going to rethink the way that a civil war or the key ideas or, you know, what perhaps um, were the underlying issues. You know, maybe if you were going to write a history of the Bogoyevich administration, you know, perhaps you would, you would um, look at things other than what, uh, other than, you know, what, is out there. You will, you'll actually be writing the history. You won't just be knowing what happened. You'll actually have to write and make assumptions about it. <clears throat> and so when you get a PhD, you are becoming an expert. You are becoming sort of the keeper, and you need to know not only the information, the history, but you need to know what is history. How do we create it? How do we know things? And the example I always like to use with history is with history, I like history as an example just because I, I think I have a good example. Um, but one of the things with history is, you know, that a history, for example, if I asked you right now, um, I'm seeing my desk, it's January 2nd, 2014. And if I were to ask you to say, what did you do on January 2nd, 2014, today, I mean, this is obviously, you know, you're, this is a week or two down the road. What did you do? And you would ask, well, how would you how would you know what you did that day? How, how did you know what happened in Springfield on that day? Well, there are various ways you could know. You could pick up a newspaper, pick up January 3rd's paper. That would tell you what happened on January 2nd. You could, um, uh, you know, you could, um, uh, you know, you could maybe look at your own calendar. You could look back to see if you were at work, look at a schedule. You could do a lot of things, but you could also, I mean, you go to your Facebook and look at the timeline. You could look at tweets. Um, you could look at your text message history. You could look at your computer history, perhaps still. You still have a, um, a accurate um, history of what you were searching for. Maybe that would tell you, oh, yeah, I was looking for, um, 
that restaurant because I was going to take so-and-so out. And that was that night that I had that horrible date or something, you know, that, that could be what you're doing. Um, and so that would be one way to do it. But what happens is, is, you know, sometimes what happens is that, you know, if we get further away or we get five, ten years down the road and we look back at this stuff, how are we going to know what happened? How are we going to know what the motives were? How are we going to know these things? Because sometimes, you know, you write a letter to a friend, you send an email, you send a tweet, you put a Facebook post, and you're not being completely honest. And so, you know, is that really an accurate way for us to know what's going on on a given day? And so, um, you know, an example I always use is, for example, if you want to know what was going on in a battle in World War II, how would you know? Well, you could look at Army memos, you could look at uh, incident reports and, and casualty reports, you could look at, you know, maps and strategic information like that, but you could also look to see what was it like on the battlefield by actually looking at things like letters from soldiers. And one of the things about that is, is that, you know, if you pulled up a letter from a soldier, you know, you'd probably get a pretty good idea that they would say, you know, it's horrible out here, it's cold, it's warm, it's night, you know, I mean, whatever the conditions would be, they would maybe write a letter home to their mom or their loved one and tell them. But can we completely trust that? Well, probably not. Why? Because the case is, is that, you know, um, you know, people who are in war probably don't tell their loved ones everything. They the loved ones are already worried and they don't want them to know that you're at home you're out there on the battlefield scared to death, that things are miserable. Maybe then again. Maybe things are great. Maybe, you know, you've been on R and R for three weeks and, you know, it's been nothing but beer and, and you know, and women and all kinds of fun. You know, are you gonna write a letter to your mom telling her that? You know, write a letter to your girlfriend or boyfriend telling them that? Probably not, right? I mean you're gonna want to keep that uh, quiet. And so these letters we have to take with a grain of salt. And so part of what history is, and what a person with a PhD, is they're not just studying what happened, but they're asking, how do we evaluate letters? How do we evaluate information? How do we evaluate Facebook posts and other things? And how do we collaborate it? And if I get two or three posts that say the same thing, is that enough to prove my point? Does that say something? Um, what if they're contradictory? How do we meet them out? How do we judge the validity? of each post and so on and so forth. And so that's a large degree of what like a history philosophy does is they're not just studying, you know, all the facts of this happened on this date and this happened on this date and they're really good with a bunch of trivia, rather they're getting to the question of how do we know things? How do we how do we actually create history? How do we actually write it? And so they're getting at these questions that are undergirding that are sort of beneath the surface that we make assumptions about when we write or understand our history and they're learning how we evaluate those and so that's sort of where you get into the actual philosophy and that happens in mathematics where they actually take apart uh, numbers and do set theory and other things they, they uh, go back to the axioms of mathematics uh, English I mean, they do the same thing. And so, you know, you can go through all these disciplines. And when you get the, the, you know, your PhD, if you go to that level, you are not just studying English, you're not just studying history, you're not just studying mathematics, you're actually studying the philosophy of those things.